So good morning, good afternoon. My name is uh, Luis Bermudez, and uh, uh, today is really my, my pleasure to present um, Andrea Aime and uh, provide his very incredible uh, guidance on how to use Tiling in your server. First, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction about uh, Geo Solutions. And uh, let's see, your sharing screen has been passed. I'm going to share again because it's somehow seems that it's paused, so I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, hopefully this is good. Um, I'm going to give a, a little introduction about what Geo Solutions is. Maybe some of you are familiar with Geo Solutions, so it's good that, that you know who we are. We were founded in 2006, so we have now offices in US starting this year. We support four main products, your server, map store, you know, the new network, and we have different kinds of offerings, enterprise support services, where uh, we support any your server, you node, or map store, your network installation that we have. Also, we support guarantee uh, your installation, different kinds of, of SLAs and, and, and so forth, we provide customized solutions. So if you are in the need of a very particular dashboard of visualization or managing of raster data, et cetera, we are able to do that. And we provide professional training. And now we are, we have more than 170 clients around the world, mostly in Europe, but also a big piece in North America and some in other continents. Uh, we support a lot of different industries. So as you know, all these tools are geo, enable a lot of different domains, um, space, metoceans, defense, natural resources, and so on. And uh, we are associated with a lot of organizations, but we want to highlight always three DCs. These are uh, OSGEO, OGC, and USGIF. And OSGEO is because we are strong support supporters of open source, and we like to, we very much like to share with the community. And for example, part of what we do is having this webinar to just help around the world about how do we do um, styles and how do we use one of the most used servers, uh, open source servers in the world, which is your server. We're all DC members, so we actively participate also advancing OGC standards making sure that it works in, in, in our products as well, but providing also some uh, guidelines of how to better structure, for example, the modern APIs that OGC is working on. And you yes, GIF, um, which fortunately the meeting got canceled this year, but we support you in standards and we always try to attend that meeting. We have lead developers in all these open source software and that's why we support them. Um, so you might be sort of familiar with all these libraries. In particular, uh, today, Andre Aime, who he is part of the user server project steering committee, and I think is the main contributor to user server, is going to um, provide the talk about uh, user server and styling. And we also have this is you know the name of, of very key people, very knowledgeable people in the open source community. So the webinar we're going is going to be divided in four parts. Uh, first, we're going to provide the context of, about why are we doing this. Uh, second, we're going to talk about cloning OSM in your server and how do we set up basic styles. Then Andrea is going to provide a practical demonstration about how to do that. And at the end, just a wrap up discussion about what are the different styling approaches in, in your server. And then we are going to open q a session. This webinar, we, we have um, a lot of time. Maybe we will finish earlier, but uh, we want to keep it in, in a slow pace so you can get the information and we have opportunities for you to interact with us, especially with Andrea. So the context is simple. Um, OSM data is very popular. You want to maybe set up OSM for base maps on your organization, and there are lots of ways to do it. You can use OSM.org, you can set up your own SM server following the, the their approach that they use in OSM.org. You can maybe pay for third parties, or maybe you can set up a robust OGC server that is able to, an OGC compliance server, 
Docs or GC standard that is able to get this data and publish it in the way that you like. There are a lot of different factors that you need to consider, you know, production readiness, uh, if you're able to customize steel, style grids, if you're able to fully customize the styles, if you have OGC endpoints, can you use it offline, do you need to pay? And all that is being uh, summarized in, in the blog, but today we're going to focus on one of the main advantages of why it's a good idea for you to set up, uh, set up an OSM server that you can customize your styles and, uh, and you can have a lot of advantages, like for example, providing OGC services so your client can interact nicely with the server that you have put in the backend. Uh, with that, um, I think I provide enough context and an introduction about who your solutions is, then I will pass then um, the presentation to Andrea. So I will stop sharing. And please you, pro provide the Q&A, all the questions at the end, we're going to have the discussion so we can keep all, you know, the flow going. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. So, <clears throat> gonna share my screen. There you go. You should be seeing my <clears throat> presentation about uh, setting up uh, an OSN clone with GeoServer and CSS. Uh, Luis, could you please yep. confirm? We can see it. Thank you. So yeah, my name is Andrea Aime. Um, I've been working on GeoServer for uh, oof, something like 14 years now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm one of the GeoServer PSC members, as well as for GeoTools. I'm a contributor to all other basic library that uh, feed into GeoServer like JIXD or ImageAOXD that we use to do raster reading and image processing. And well, specifically today, I'm going to um, follow up uh, and, and, and look at how to stand up uh, OSM data in GeoServer. In particular, I'm going to start with the, the story uh, uh, of um, uh, of this uh, of this work because it goes it goes way back. So back to this, what are we talking about today? In, we are talking about about this, and you may say, well, okay, the GeoServer homepage, almost but not quite. In particular, this map. And again, you could say, well, okay, that's the OpenStreetMap uh, on uh, Bucharest because this presentation was given at Phosphogy Bucharest in 2019, the first time. And uh, sure, but uh, I want to draw you your attention to uh, the information here at the bottom it says data OpenStreetMap contributors. It's fine. We are using OpenStreetMap uh, map data and we are advertising it but says also rendering geo solutions. So what you're looking here is not really tiles from openstreetmap.org. They are tiles rendered by GeoServer. In particular from uh, this WMTS and uh, well, you can, uh, you can have a look uh, at it. And if you want to also load it into, uh, into whatever application, whatever OGC client for WMTS you want and use the OSM layer. So what's behind it? How are we building the tiles? The map uh, comes uh, from uh, OSM data that we import using Imposum3, which is uh, uh, an application written in Go, uh, which is a, uh, a programming language that's becoming quite popular. And uh, this loader loads it uh, into a PostJS database this, this is kind of nice because, you know, OpenStreetMap uh, data is not really that well organized. It's just a bunch of lines, points, and polygons with uh, variable tags attached to it. What Imposum does is to process this data and uh, uh, through a mapping file allows you to organize it into layers so that you have uh, layers for roads, layers for buildings, layers for uh, named places, and so on and so on, which is 
the data model that you typically find in a WMS and WMTS server. Once it's there, we use some styles that I wrote, uh, that we wrote in GeoCSS, which is the CSS uh, variant uh, of, uh, of GeoServer. It's a CSS styling language uh, bent towards uh, um, rendering maps. And I'm, I'm going to talk about, uh, about it a bit more later. And then it goes, all goes into the GeoServer rendering pipeline and we get the map that we want. A map which is not exactly the same, but quite similar to OpenStreetMap.org. So motivation and history, why did we start doing this? Uh, there have been several attempts online to use GeoServer to render um, OpenStreetMap. Open, OSM in a box was uh, one of the first attempts. It was really nice for the times. It was using SLDs and its own way to import uh, the, the data, uh, the OpenStreetMap data in PostGIS. Unfortunately, it died uh, several years ago. Uh, it's one of the first, it was really good, but uh, it fell and maintained uh, several years ago. Uh, then we have uh, uh, these Melbo Surfer OSM GeoServer styles, which are available uh, today. Uh, they also seem not maintained anymore. They are quite a bit simpler while OSM in a box was quite similar to OSM. And then we have the Boundless Geo OSM, which uh, also fell and unmaintained when Boundless got up, um, acquired by Planet and uh, refocused on, uh, on a different market. So there were starting points, but all of them were kind of different and some of them uh, were um, not matching uh, OpenStreetMap.org. Some were very old and included some bits of technology that was unmaintained. And uh, well, since I started it in my spare time, more importantly, they weren't using GeoCSS. And I'm the maintainer, the current maintainer of the, the language. I wanted to push the language uh, forward and I needed a, a significant task to, it, to do it. So rendering OpenStreetMap seemed to be the, the reason. But more importantly, like the man said many years ago, we choose to clone OSM not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Actually, well, the man said something else. Uh, he was talking about going to the moon, but uh, um, if you pass me the, the parallel, it's interesting to, uh, to get a task which is hard uh, because it moves us outside of our comf uh, comfort zone and it has a lot of um, uh, interesting points. The data set is huge and playing with huge data sets uh, brought up um, requirements for improvements in, uh, in GeoServer performance, for example. There is a lot of details. So uh, the styling is very rich, which also pushed uh, some of the envelope in terms of what GeoServer can render. And the style sheet is really complicated. It's, it's uh, enormous. So uh, that was another reason to uh, try to target it. Working on it provided uh, not just an open street map, but a number of improvements in GeoServer itself that are useful for everybody, not just people doing OSM tiles, such as, for example, improvements in the GeoServer style editor, improvements in the CSS language and translator, improvements in the speed at which we loaded the data from PostGIS, and at which we render the data once in memory and more. So regardless of whether you care specifically about OSM or not, this endeavor, given uh, its size and complication, brought a number of improvements that are of general use. So when did we start? With, uh, I started in my spare time in 2017, uh, setting up the first round of data imports and styles, adding all the symbology for points, lines, and polygons, but uh, I didn't endeavor into labels. And it was a long, war, long work uh, done during weekends. Two hours here, three hours there, for a few months. Um, that already brought uh, significant improvements. I added uh, support for nested rules in CSS. I improved the, the, the conversion between CSS and, uh, and SLD 
uh, a lot. And uh, uh, we introduced the side-by-side -side style editor in GeoServer. Uh, just a sec. Okay, moving on. Uh, eventually in 2017, I, I realized that it was too big to do in my spare time and uh, I gave up. Uh, the, the data directory, the initial data directory was, uh, is still uh, out there if you want to go to this URL. Uh, but yeah, it, it became too much of a burden to do only in spare time. So in 2018, uh, GeoSolutions got a, a sponsored job to uh, deliver uh, an offline OpenStreetMap-like uh, background map for uh, an institution. A requirement where it should look more or less like OSM, be available completely offline, and more importantly, uh, uh, the requirement was not to depend on any external provider because it was for a, uh, for a big public institution and uh, they had this requirement to be self-sufficient. Uh, so that uh, the whole system would keep on working, even if OpenStreetMap.org was going down or Google Maps uh, was not provided for free anymore and, and stuff like that. So we added um, labels for all uh, the elements. We added um, more performance improvements and uh, we started working on a new way to translate CSS uh, uh, into SLD to handle even larger style sheets. I'm gonna, gonna talk about it more. Finally, in 2019, we had a, a second round of, uh, of work to do, and we, we made um, further improvements in talking to PostGIS, in evaluating filters in memory, because a style sheet uh, um, matches features uh, against the rules, so it evaluates a lot of filters in memory and uh, we improved the encoding in PNG8. And eventually, also in 2019, we, um, uh, we made the, the styles, the CSS styles available. It wasn't the full data directory, it was just the styles, but if you check uh, the, the, the repository right now, uh, you will find that it's uh, a full data directory. Uh, some time ago in preparation for this webinar, we prepared the full data directory that everybody can use. Also thanks to the sponsorship of, of a couple of uh, uh, GeoSolutions customers. So, first of all, when you, when you want to, to start rendering OSM, you have to choose the, let's say, right style. What does that mean? If you look on the internet, there are many, many style sheets that are called OSM Bright. OSM Bright is the name of the style that you can find at OpenStreetMap.org. However, only one of them is the official OSM style, and you can find it in this GitHub repository, GitHub Gravity Storm OpenStreetMap Dash Carto. And it looks more or less like this. However, there are other options. Two popular ones are Mapbox and OpenMap uh, tiles. They both have an OSM write of sort. Uh, what they have in common is that uh, um, they, they loosely base the style on the official style, but very loosely, but they made different rendering choices and they prepared the much simpler maps. Let me show you a side-by-side -side comparison. So in the middle here, we have OpenStreetMap.org, the official. At the top, we have Mapbox. At the bo bottom, OpenMap tiles. As you can see, uh, the OS official OSM match map is uh, richer in, in terms of details. It has more labels. It has more uh, features in the map, generally speaking. The, the map is more dense visually. The map box and the open map tiles instead are lighter. So what I'm seeing here 
uh, and well, okay, let, let's have a look also on, uh, I don't know, the comparison. This is the area where we did the, the Phosphor G 2019. And again, you can see comparing side-by-side -side OSM and open map tiles, that OSM has much more details. Um, while open map tiles is lighter. So what do we see here? Well, um, there are different objectives, really. Open official of OSM tries to represent as many details as possible. It tries to be sort of an atlas. Mapbox and open map tiles versions are more like base maps. They are simpler. They leave space for overlays. So they are still uh, inspired by OSM, but it would be really nice if they didn't call them OSM Bright because, well, they are nothing like the original style. What are the consequences of uh, doing uh, uh, these different styles? Well, uh, skipping many details means that one has to render, uh, well, one has to read and render less data. So there is less IO, there is less CPU usage. The style is faster to process. And uh, so we could have chosen the Mapbox variation or the open map tiles variation, but the objective objective was to uh, go against the OSM and do something because it was hard, because it was proving challenging. So we kept the, orig the original style instead. Challenges. What challenges we, did we uh, face during this work? Many. So what was the approach that we took? We took the default imposon tree uh, mapping file, which is uh, quite close to uh, what one needs to render uh, OpenStreetMap. It already lays out uh, the data in uh, nice uh, layers, and uh, it imports the more or less all the data that is actually needed to render OSM, with very few exceptions. Then we took the, um, the styles provided by the Gravity Storm um, repository, and we manually translated them from Carto CSS to GeoCSS. Why manually? Uh, well, because uh, I wanted to double check each and every bit and also turn it into something that were, what was more idiomatic to GeoCSS. Uh, Carto CSS is based on uh, Mapbox, which has its own set of names and its own uh, ways of doing things like uh, um, KZ roads and the like. So I wanted to turn it into something that actually looked like GeoCSS. And uh, doing a translator was not going to be easy either. So I went little by little doing the, the, manual, uh, the manual road, um, which proved uh, useful also because I was forced to use the GeoServer user interface to do everything like a normal user. And uh, along the road, we fixed any hiccup that we found. First big um, difference is that uh, Carto CSS uh, reasons in terms of zoom levels, which is easy, but also limiting. GeoCSS instead uses scale denominators. Why, why am I saying that it's limiting? Because you get the, let's say, 20 some zoom levels that are in uh, the web mercator well-known grid set. And, uh, what if you wanted to use a different one? What if you wanted to, to go WGS84? Yes, it still has 20 zoom levels, but they are off by one compared to Web Mercator, if you ever checked. Um, like uh, the, the amount uh, of uh, zooming level that you get from uh, the, the same number in the, in the two grid set is not the same. Uh, uh, the uh, Web Mercator is actually zoomed in uh, like twice as much if memory serves me right. And what about if I'm using a, um, a grid set which is specific for a particular country? Uh, many countries provide uh, um, grid sets that are in their own um, local coordinate reference system, the one that, that is supposed to be used by official cartography in that country. And they don't even use the powers of four uh, zoom levels, but they are based on round scale denominators. So they got one zoom level for one to 1,000, and then one zoom level for one to 2,000, one to 5,000, one to 10,000. 
which means the, the number of tiles doesn't double, uh, doesn't go up by four at every zoom level, sorry. And uh, the, the scale denominator uh, doesn't halve every time. So again, uh, for all these reasons, it's uh, more flexible to have a style that talks in terms of scale denominators because it makes it general. You can apply it all the same to all types of grid sets. Now, how do we go from zoom to scale since, that, since the, um, the styles here talk about zoom, 13, 15, 17, 19, what do we do here? So scale denominators are, um, sorry, the, the zoom levels are, are matched to a scale denominator. You can go into the GeoServer grid set definitions and have a look and th there they are. You have a, a scale denominator matched to a zoom level. And these are the numbers for web Mercator. So zoom level one is one to 279 uh, million. Um, and the zoom two is uh, one to 139 millions and so on and so on. These numbers are difficult to remember and they are odd. Also, uh, if we want to uh, set up thresholds, it's not a good idea to set thresholds at the exact zoom level, because if I move my scale denominator just a bit above or, or below, I might switch to another set of rules which was designed to, uh, to, work, to, to be used for half of the resolution or twice as the, or the resolution. So it's, it's too fragile. What I did was to take the, the mid cut instead. So I, wanted, I targeted more or less the, the, the mid between the two zoom levels and then made it into a round number so that it was easier to type and express. This resulted in uh, this translation table which, uh, guess what, resulted in uh, um, zoom levels and uh, scale denominators, which are actually sort of sane. So uh, we get 1 to 3,000, 1 to 6,000, uh, 12,500, 25,000, 50,000, and so on and so on. So decent looking numbers. And so basically every time I had to translate, oh yeah, so uh, this rule activate at zoom level seven, yeah, okay, let's make it active at uh, when the scale denominator is, is below six million then, and so on. Um, even uh, with the smaller numbers and so on, the, the, the styles are very, very long in, uh, in uh, OpenStreetMap. And even if uh, expressing them in GeoCSS was a bit shorter, and you can see a comparison it here between the rod.mss, which is car to CSS, and rod.css, which is the GeoServer GeoCSS, and you can see it's like uh, one third, they were still too long. They were still uh, thousands of lines. And it was evident that the, the GeoServer style editor was uh, too small. It was difficult to edit stuff in it. See, this is the value of actually using the tools to eat your own dog food to, to figure out problems that uh, the normal user uh, face. So uh, in response to that, uh, we've introduced a full screen uh, editor mode uh, that you can activate since a couple of years now that uh, allows to have uh, the, map on, the map on one side and the, the style on the other side using the entire screen just for that, which makes editing the, the style much easier. Also, I was doing lots of typos. I, I'm well known to do typos when I type. So I introduced a uh, quick uh, code completion in, in the editor that everybody can use to type faster and, and do uh, less errors along the way. It was initially introduced for uh, CSS, then we, uh, we found that it was useful and it was extended to SLD as well. So right now you can also type the, the, all that nice XML if you want using code completion. You just need a, a recent version enough of GeoServer. GeoServer 216 should be supporting that. Then another thing that was really verbose was these big numbers. So if we go back to this table, 
I have uh, 400 millions and 200 millions, and here I added little dots to you know make them easier to read. But in, uh, in, in XML or in CSS, you cannot do that. And when you st start having like nine or 10 or 12 zero in a row, it's difficult to, to, to figure out just by a glance if that was 400,000 or 4 million or 40,000. And uh, that just takes away time and makes debugging the style more difficult. So we uh, introduced a uh, uh, support for uh, the um, um, suffixes to imply thousand and million and, and so on. So you can add K or M and that makes the, the scales much easier to read. So it, here it's, it's having a dot. I'm talking about 400,000 as, as the scale denominator. I don't have to count zeros to do that. Um, Another thing that was annoying was that uh, um, in OSM Bright there is a lot of Z level dependencies. Let me let me show you again this style. So if zoom level is greater than 13, then use this line width. If it's greater than 15, then uh, use a, use another line width, and so on and so on and so on, repeating all these uh, conditions and uh, and widths and so on, which makes the style quite a bit verbose. So what do uh, we could have done the same and say, oh yeah, if a scale denominator is less than 200k, use that. If a scale denominator is less, what down on the k, use another, and so on. But it was too verbose. So we ended up using the categorize function instead. Categorize is a function that has been introduced in SLD 1.1 by OGC. And uh, it's just a little way to set up a table. So you say categorize, categorize based on this variable, in this case, at SD, that is the current scale denominator of the map being requested. And, uh, and then we say, okay, below 50K, use nine. Below 100K, so between 500K, 5K and 100K, use seven. Between 200K and 100K, use 5.5. .5. And above, use five. So that reduced all these verbose and, and repetitive ro um, uh, rules into a tiny uh, table approach, which also reduced the size of the CSSs. Another thing that we find, found out during the translation was that OSM Bright was using a lot of SVG icons as shapes instead of images. Typically, GeoServer would take an SVG and treat it as a scalable image. So it would use its own native colors, for example, uh, the fields, the strokes, and so on. But there was no way to say, take this SVG and recolor it brown. So we added this, this ability, which ag again is, is available for everybody. So here we, we see the, the little SVG, which is a completely black in its own original version. We added the ability to treat it as a SLD mark uh, which then allows us to specify a fill and a stroke for it, so change its appearance. And uh, yeah, uh, so this is a snippet of uh, CSS. If the type is fast food and scale denominator is less than 6K, use this fast food or the SVG as the mark, or scale it to 10 pixels, and then fill it with this color, which is a brownish color. Then moving on, we started translating larger and larger style sheet and uh, it became evident that translating the CSS to SLD was taking so much time, like minutes. And GeoServer actually needs to do that. There is no CSS rendering engine in GeoServer. GeoServer really at its core understands only SLD. So all the alternative languages such as CSS, Mapbox styles, YSLD, they all translate down to an equivalent SLD style. CSS was particularly bad because in CSS you have cascading. That is, the various rules that you pull, put in the sheet interact with each other, and the more specific rules override the definition of more general rules. But the problem is 
you have to find all this relationship, which, is, which means you have to take all the rules, try to combine them with each other, see if one overrides part of the other, and generate the equivalent SLD. Trying all the possible combination when you have a CSS style, which is, I don't know, 1,000 lines with uh, 50 or 100 rules, can take a lot of time because the combine combinatorics of, of it make for a very large number of combination. It's very time consuming. The first approach was to just make the same, the same uh, work faster. And we achieved actually a 10, uh, 10 times speed up, uh, which allowed us to work on most of the styles uh, with, the, with a sub-second save time, with sub-second translation time between CSS and SLD. And it was nice. Problem. There was a still one style, the roads and the amenities, actually two styles, sorry, the roads and the amenities, which were just too long. They were well over a hundred, uh, a thousand lines each. And those were still taking like several seconds of translation time, too much for interactive editing. So what did we do? Well, we realized that Carto CSS is not really doing cascading. Each rule is actually independent from each other. So they are actually more or less acting like SLD rules, where you stumble into the rules, you apply it, and then you move to the next rule and you apply it and so on. They don't interact with each other. Eventually they paint on top of each other, but they don't mix with each other. They don't override properties from each other. Also, uh, that was one of the things that we were being asked over and over. Can I have a CSS? Um, people were saying, I like the, the syntax. It's much more compact. But I don't quite understand the cascading machinery, the override by selectivity. Can I have a, a, a style sheet which is flat, just like SLD, just having a nice syntax? So we made a translation mode for uh, CSS that works just uh, that way, the flat translation mode. The flat translation mode basically reads your CSS as it is and translate each CSS rule into an equivalent SLD rule directly. No cascading, so much faster, and for many people, simpler to understand. People among you that are used to HTML and CSS might disagree, and in some cases, Cascading is really powerful, but for many, having a, a simpler one-to-one -one, uh, mechanism to go from CSS to SLD was better. So with this change, we managed to translate fast and quickly also roads and amenities. And uh, this resulted in uh, interactive editing uh, being possible, and the generated SLD was quite a bit smaller and thus also faster to render. In particular, our roads.css, which is 38 kilobytes, translates to an equivalent SLD, which is just one megabyte. You should have seen when it was 36. And this brought us to having the map that we wanted. Isn't that nice? However, there was a catch. This map, this cartography, this dense styling is really meant to build the tiles that you then fetch from OpenStreetMap.org. So they don't really care all that much if building the tiles is fast or slow because they just have to build the tiles and then they are going to be served over and over uh, over the internet. So even if it takes a bit more time to, to generate them, it's not a big trouble. You can scale up the servers, for example. And they have machinery to only regenerate the tiles that have been affected by edits on OpenStreetMap. In, in my case, I was actually just looking at the map with WMS, so no caching at all. And I was not satisfied with the speed that I was getting. I should have expected that, but I wanted, I wanted more. So how do you get faster performance out um, of a system that was designed to just be tile cached. The first step was to avoid having to deal with massive tables. 
you know, OpenStreetMap is a, is a multi-zoom uh, map, and things, features, start showing up only at a certain zoom level. You don't need to look at all the roads on, in the world, including all the secondary roads and the tertiary roads and the path on the mountains, when you're rendering a nationwide uh, road network. You just need the motorways, right? So to leverage that, we use the pre-generalized data store and a setup that contains only the, the, the data that we need at a given zoom level. How do we do that? In Imposum, there is a way to set up pre-generalized uh, tables. They are like um, tables that are set on the side, meant to be displayed only a certain, at a certain set of zoom levels, and they contain simplified geometries, which is the first speed up, but also they contain less features. They are filtered down so that they contain only the features that display at that zoom level. And this is what, and uh, Imposum allows you to create these tables during the import, which is nice. And GeoServer can read them and treat them as if it was a single layer um, using the pre-generalized data store. Here we are saying, okay, take the, the, the data store, which is called OSM, and uh, <clears throat> please use um, OSM roads, the OSM roads table uh, as the base, but when the generalization distance, that is when a pixel is like 200 meters, please use the, the table OSM roads gen zero. And when the uh, generalization distance, that is the, the pixel size is 50 meters, then please OSM roads, please use OSM roads gen one. So when we are trying to just display motorways because the style says so, we go to a table that actually contains only motorways. And it contains like uh, one thousandth of the original data, which makes it much faster to render. That improved things quite a bit, but not enough. So we started doing profiling sessions with a, with a Java profiler, in particular Java Mission Control, to find out where the CPU was spent while rendering the data. And we, we found out that there was no big issue taking 90% of the time. It was like spread out in various places. And attacking each one of them, we managed to get another significant speed up. In particular, we found that uh, the communication to the database was slowed down a lot by SSL encryption. Nowadays, when a client talks to PostgreSQL, they default to setting up an SSL encrypted connection. SSL encryption and decryption takes a very significant toll on the communication. So we added a way in GeoServer to just disable the SSL. There's a flag to, to turn it off. If your server and your database are well protected by it, as DMZ, then you can take uh, the step of disabling SSL and get a significant speed up. Then we found that uh, transferring the WKBs, that is the geometries, was a bit slow. Uh, this problem was attacked by other people before us, in particular by Carto, uh, CartoDB people. And they created an alternative encoding co called the tiny WKB, which is much smaller in terms of payload and faster to generate and designed to work with generalized data. So we also created support for tiny WKB in GeoServer, getting another speed up. <coughs> Finally, looking at the transfers, we found that uh, GeoServer was talking to uh, PostgreSQL using mostly an ASCII-based protocol. That is, it was trading characters back and forth, which is not particularly efficient. There is a way to trigger a fully, full binary transfer instead. So transfer, let's say, numbers, binary codes instead of chars. And uh, we found a way to enable it, and that also gave us a speed up. 
So that was, let's say, the first round of optimization, it all uh, focused on talking to the database. Then we uh, focused on evaluating uh, the, the styles in memory. So we found out that uh, it was uh, possible to rewrite the filters to make the execution much faster. We found out that it was possible to speed up the way we were encoding tiles in PNG8. And we got another CPU usage reduction. And uh, here we are. Uh, actually, here we are. This slide it dates back to uh, August 2019. Back then, in August 2019, the map was fast enough at high and low zoom levels. And it still needed improvements in the mid levels because it was struggling, uh, still struggling getting data out of the database. We actually made further work since then, and we optimized the way Imposum lays out the tables, creating more generalized tables. We found out that uh, there weren't enough of them, and uh, some of them were containing too much data. That's why we were struggling to, to get uh, the data out. And secondly, we found out that we weren't running, due to space limitations, one of the steps of the Imposum import, in particular the optimize step which relay out the table to optimize the, the uh, spatial index of it. Once we took those two steps, we actually got a, a, a map that renders quite fast. And um, uh, let me skip this part. Um, we, um, we shared all of that in this data directory that we, um, at the beginning it was all just styles, but right now, it's a full data directory. So let me let me share uh, that for a second. Um, I'm gonna switch the application that I'm sharing. Give me a second. And so here we are. Uh, nowadays, this uh, data directory. Let me also share the link to the chat. It isn't there. Hello? Just did. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so this directory contains a full definition of all the workspaces and stored and styles and layers and so on, along with uh, uh, a Docker image and a platform independent binary that we shared uh, specifically for this webinar so that you can get started quickly, and instructions on how to set up things for a production environment uh, in, um, in a step-by-step -step fashion, uh, grabbing the low resolution data, getting, uh, uh, standing up an OSM PostGIS database, and uh, setting up the necessary fonts and so on, and eventually get uh, get the map. So the next step would be uh, to have a look at this data directory. But before we go there, uh, I'm going to take uh, some questions before you know we we switch topic. So if you want to to follow the questions and answers, um, um, section. In, um, in Zoom, you have a Q&A with uh, a couple of balloons on top of it. And uh, if you want to write questions there uh, about this uh, OSM uh, uh, style development effort, uh, I'm going to answer them. So please let us know. I think we have no questions, Andrea. It seems so. Good. So you are a good presenter. <laughs> <laughs> how do you disable SSL and how to enable Base64? Actually, um, all right. So I have a GeoServer running here that I can, uh, that, that is the one, <clears throat> it's the one that we shared in the emails and instructions. So the SSL is actually a driver configuration parameter, so nothing fancy there. 
then if you are using a recent enough version of GS Server, among the many, uh, okay, sorry, I picked the wrong input. Oh, right, sorry. Because this data directory uses two geo packages instead of the PostGIS. Let me, let me try to configure a PostGIS instead. Add a new store, PostGIS. There you are, there you are. So towards the end of the PostGIS uh, connection parameters, there is the SSL mode, and you can set it to disable. If it's unset, it's gonna default to whatever the default is, which is, uh, I think, allow. And the, 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 the client and the server will negotiate and typically will start using SSL. Uh, you can force it to disable this way, SSL mode to disable. So that answers the, the first question from Carlo. Uh, and uh, uh, what about uh, uh, disabling base 64? You just have to enable prepare statements. That, that's what does it. The relationship between the JDC, JDBC driver and uh, the, um, uh, and the server is set up in such a way that if you are using prepare statements, then the driver starts using binary transfer. And if not, it doesn't. There's no binary transfer flag. It just happens automatically as you start using prepare statements. Uh, okay, did you take any evaluation of the RSM style overall? It seems quite outdated. It's indeed it is. So if we go back to the presentation, uh, or if you think back at the presentation, uh, the initial style was done in 2017, and then uh, we moved uh, to uh, doing um, styling uh, on a customer by customer project basis. So in uh, the styling that we did, did, we did in 2018 was uh, for uh, this large uh, institution. They were happy with what we were providing, so no, no updates were done. Then uh, we, we did another project with uh, two smaller companies, and again, they, they were, had no troubles with the styling we had, so it was not updated. Then we did another couple of um, uh, developments, but they wanted um, um, a very simplified style uh, for, as a base map for satellite imagery, so again, we didn't go into details. The way it's moving, uh, it's that we are going to update the style to uh, an up-to-date version of OSM if uh, a customer project comes in that requires it. Otherwise, it's likely going to stay this way. And we are going to create more and more alternatives of the styling as we move forward. But there is no set plan, plan to keep up with uh, the, the changes in OSM.org. Um, okay, how many percent to do these settings improve the speed? Uh, which settings though? Because we, um, uh, are we talking about the PostgreSQL uh, ones? If so, I'd say around 30% because there's a lot of time also spent during rendering and PNG encoding. Yeah, Andrea, there is another question about, uh, can you show me how to translate MXD to SLD? Uh, we cannot. Uh, MXD, MXDs are ESRI uh, own uh, styling, right? So there, there is, a, as far as I know, no open source um, uh, solution to, to translate an MXD to uh, an SLD, however, uh, for the sake of completeness, there is a solution that, he, that you can pay for, which is called uh, Geocat Bridge. It's, it's an add-on that you can install in uh, ArcMap, and it will take a project, an ArcMap project, and uh, then it connects via the REST API to a GeoServer and translates all the styling to SLD uh, loads up the, the data if necessary and so on. 
but it's not open source. Um, okay. We have any more question? Yeah, there, there is one about uh, where can I get the style editor you just showed? Which was so the server one, I guess. Th this, this one. No, I think it's the style editor. That is not the style editor. The the style editor for GeoServer or wait. Yeah, Andrea, I, th I think it's the user server one, unless, you know. Oh, the, G the GeoServer server one is, uh, is built into GeoServer. server. You just need to update GeoServer server to a recent enough version. So if I log in, wait, let me, let me switch to this page, right. So I go to styles, pick uh, one style addresses. Okay, so this, this is more or less the view that you are used to. But if you use this uh, uh, full screen uh, mode, you switch to a side-by-side -side representation of the style and the uh, uh, map preview. In this case, we are looking at house numbers, which will show up only when I'm fairly zoomed in. There's nothing to see here, of course, because I'm showing a map at uh, one to two million and the uh, scale denominator is here. Uh, trigger the house numbers at the one to 6,000. So, but yeah, this is a style editor. Um, it's built in into GeoServer. You just, you just need to, to use a GeoServer 216 or newer, which I recommend very much. There is a lot of people using older versions of GeoServer. They are uh, typically slower. They are not supported. Uh, they have uh, a few known security issues that have been fixed later. So please keep up to date with the, with the releases. Try to upgrade GeoServer like once a year or something like that. What about the open materials and vital base in the latest version of GeoServer? Is, going, is it going to be demonstrated? No, we are not going to demonstrate it today. It's a, um, it's a completely different uh, setup. In that case, one needs uh, um, an open map tiles, uh, MB tiles source, uh, which uh, um, I think I recognize the, na the name. Are you uh, one of the uh, people behind open map tiles? I think you are, but maybe I, I'm just uh, confused. Yes. Okay, that's you. Okay, so yeah. Um, uh, unfortunately not. Um, we, we don't have a data directory to, uh, to use uh, the, um, the MB tiles uh, filled with the Mapbox vector tiles uh, yet. So that, uh, uh, anyways, I can talk, uh, talk about it quickly. There's a, um, a community module, so on, uh, one that is not officially supported that can read on MB tiles filled with the vector tiles. And, uh, uh, and uh, you can go to open map tiles and download one. Um, the, they are free for non-commercial use, usage and uh, uh, you have to pay for commercial usage uh, of sorts. Go to the website um, and, and find out uh, the licensing defaults, uh, sorry, the, the licensing details. Anyways, for uh, uh, I downloaded a sample for personal usage, and that's uh, legit. And then you can go to the Open Map Tiles uh, GitHub. Um, like here. So you can go to openmaptiles.org, and uh, there's a way to download it. I, uh, yeah, here, download map tiles. And you can download the, the OpenStreetMap vector tiles. You will go here for the download. You have to uh, yeah, specify like non-commercial personal project. And then you will download uh, the whole world, which is going to be 51 gigabytes of, uh, of data. It's going to be a, a very large SQLite database. And GeoServer can, can use it and, and use it for render. And then you can go to the styles, which are on GitHub, like this one. 
and fetch this this style, the the, um, the open map tile, so it's a bright GL style, and uh, use it with the GeoServer um, um, Mapbox vector tiles support. Sorry, Mapbox styles support, and put them together, and GeoServer will render server side map which are very similar to what you can get here on open map tiles. But no, we we haven't yet. Um, set up a, a data directory for people to try. I also opened a few tickets here, uh, probably not in this repository, but in, in other uh, repository, in other styles, because there were mismatches. Uh, anyways, it would be interesting to follow up uh, maybe via email, because uh, it, it's interesting, but it doesn't always work one-to-one. -one. It seems that the um, vector tiles that are inside the, um, uh, the downloads from openmaptiles.org are not an exact match for what the styles expect. Um, more questions. How can GPU be utilized in rendering? What are the challenges? We cannot. Uh, the, the rendering is done through software by the JDK itself. And uh, so um, there is no uh, support for GPU. It could be built, but it's uh, definitely not trivial. Uh, I'm having enough memory in my machine, so I can use maximum memory to speed up my teller response. Well, uh, getting more memory is, uh, let's say, not going to... Um, uh, speed up rendering per se, but uh, uh, you can uh, you can um, cache the tiles in memory in GeoServer in the configuration. So let me take one step back. GeoServer tries to do uh, its own work using as little memory as possible for each request, so that one can serve a large number of requests. So there is no data in memory caching, for example. GeoServer does not cache the, the source vector. Uh, it could be implemented, and nobody has sponsored such kind of work in, uh, well, since your server existed, but it could be done. Um, um, GeoServer, through the tile cache, can, can cache the responses in, uh, um, uh, on disk. And if you have an SSD, then the, the, the response is going gonna, is gonna to be blazing fast. If you are not happy, or if your data changes so fast that, that it's difficult to to keep a large cache on disk, um, you can go here in the, uh, I don't remember exactly where it is, probably in the blob stores. Anyways, the, there is a way to enable an in-memory, an in-memory cache of tiles. Here, there it is. You can set how many megabytes of memory cache you want to dedicate to keeping in memory vector tiles or a PNG tiles and then so on. And then uh, that's going to cut down the last few milliseconds uh, reading tiles from the disk, even if it's an SSD. But typically what uh, slows you down or the real bottleneck typically is the outgoing network. So you need to have a, a very fast network before you start uh, considering enabling in-memory caching and stuff like that. Okay, so this one is done. Um, I have 100 layers I want to upload to Geonode. Uh, sorry, uh, this one is, is off topic. Uh, I would suggest to go to the Geonode mailing list and, uh, and get an answer there. It's not about OSM styling. Okie dokie. Anything else? What is the required recommended hardware configuration to serve the entire OpenStreetMap planet? Um, good question. Well, you know that it uh, requires a, a very large hard drive in order to uh, impose on the, the, the data. 
and uh, to keep it in uh, PostgreSQL. Uh, half, uh, 500 gigabytes is gonna be the minimum, but it might be a bit tight, especially if you want to keep uh, the, um, the Imposum cache to do periodic, periodic updates. Uh, so in our uh, latest server, we, um, we opted for a one terabyte uh, storage. Uh, and then uh, um, I think that we have a 12 uh, CPUs, it's a Xeon, and we have uh, 16 gigabytes of memory. And uh, that's about it. And um, let me see if I can show something. Maps, Geo Solutions Group, uh, Geo Server. Yeah. And uh, oh, right. okay. No, I, I don't have the necessary. Uh, so th this is the, the the server that I was talking about, but uh, it's being set up like right now. Um, the old one that was published in just Europe was much smaller. And it's the one that's powering the, the GeoServer uh, map, uh, um, map preview. So yeah, this is, ser this is serving on the fly or almost on the fly Europe. And uh, it's like four CPUs, eight gigabyte of memory, and a uh, hard drive, which is not even an SSD, it's a spinning disks. And uh, dealing with Europe, you can have a much smaller um, disk, like 200 gigabytes is probably gonna, gonna be enough. Okay. Uh, remember that the target here is to serve OGC protocols, so vector tiles are out of the picture, and to serve in other um, um, coordinate reference systems, eventually on the fly. So e eventually also filtering data on the fly and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's not as static as setting up a mapbook vector tiles cache. Also, GeoServer can also be used to serve the vector tiles if one wants to out of this data set. It's just a matter of installing the vector tiles plugin. All right. Uh, does increasing my connection or a max open connection help me uh, reducing the response time? To some extent, yes. Some, um, um, I have a, a small anecdote that, uh, that was uh, coming from uh, our experience in consulting. Uh, at one point we had this, this customer that was uh, complaining about uh, lack of scalability in GeoServer. And uh, he was saying, well, uh, I have a very large hardware and GeoServer is not taking advantage of it. We, uh, they had like 24 cores available. We went uh, to look at it and the, the, uh, the connection pool for PostgreSQL was set to having a max connection of 10. That basically limits the number of requests that you can serve to 10. You, you, can, you can serve a bit more because PNG encoding is done separately and at that point the connection is already closed. But uh, there's a proportionality between uh, the number of connection you have to the database and the number of co concurrent requests that you can handle. Typically, you want to, to have a number of max connections which is twice as big as a number of cores in your machine. So you have eight cores, you want 16 connections max. Uh, going beyond that doesn't, is, is not going to, uh, to help you. But uh, you need to at least match the, the cores that you have, actually match it two times. <clears throat> in my system I have 100 max connections and GeoServer is not utilizing that much. Of course, 
uh, it's one connection per request. So you want to see 100 connections used, you need to generate 100 concurrent requests, which is not going to be efficient, by the way, because uh, peak throughput is normally achieved at, as I said, two times the number of cores that you have in, in your machine. So you, if you have a machine that has eight cores, your peak is typically around the 16 concurrent requests, and you want to use the control flow extension to limit your server to only uh, physically run 16 request and uh, queue all the others. All right. I think we had enough questions. Let's move on and explore a bit the, the setup and the data directory, OK? All right, so every one of you uh, got, should have got an email with uh, uh, a small Docker image. <coughs> with a geo server that, <coughs> sorry, either a, do a Docker image or a platform in the independent binary that you can run. <coughs> the, the data directory contains, in this simple example, two geo packages. One is called OSM low, low res, and it contains worldwide data, so covering the entire planet, but it's the low resolution layers. It's the layers that we use when we are fairly zoomed out. So if you look by, yeah, by stores, you can find uh, the ice sheets, the land polygons, the boundaries, the countries, mm, uh, the simplified water polygons, the built up area, and so on and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, when I'm looking at the map, fairly zoomed out, like here, it's mostly using uh, this worldwide data set uh, meant for a low resolution display. And then we have the OSM uh, source, which is the other package. Typically, in your, let's say, production setup, you would, be, you would have a PostgreSQL database. But for the sake of uh, simplicity, in this setup, we created another geo package. It's actually pretty simple. You just do the, um, the import through Imposam into PostGIS, and then you can use a command line utility such as OGR to OGR to turn it into a geo package. That's what we did for, for this example. In particular, uh, we wanted an example that was uh, uh, small, but not too small. So we took. Um, the state of New York, like not the city, the entire state, you can see it here, and uh, uh, downloaded it and imported it post to PostJS and then turned it into a geo package. And you can see uh, my, um, my local machine, which is a Windows laptop, uh, very underpowered. It's a Core i5, 8 gigabytes, very small SSD. Mm which is rendering it as I go. So I, I have all the other layers, but um, uh, with full detail over this particular area. And then you can see that we have two pre-generalized um, sources. One is for OSM, so that we can read the, the generalized version of the roads and the water areas and the waterways and so on. And then there is also a pre-generalized low resolution uh, which is not used by this OSM map, but by another map. We recently uh, added into uh, this uh, data directory a couple of other variants of uh, OSM that can be used as background for satellite imagery, or let's say, generally speaking, for uh, low resolution data. They are OSM Simple Light and OSM Simple Dark. In this data set, we have, uh, as you can see, a bathymetry, which is actually vector data. It's not rasters. We took it from uh, uh, Natural Earth. And uh, um, it's actually a relatively heavy data set. It's beautiful to look at, in my opinion. And uh, yeah, um, this one is detailed enough that we made a pre-generalized version of it with the simplified geometries, because many of these geometries are actually 
pretty complicated. And here we have in one table the, bat the bat bathymetry polygons at a, um, a different uh, depth, and we are rendering them, sorting them by, by depth, and then you're using a different color. It's actually a good example of doing styling in CSS, so let me show you quickly. Bathymetry light, there you go. So see, I'm sorting by the depth attribute. I'm using a background color, uh, which is uh, the, the color of the uh, highest bathymetry, because the bathymetry and the land uh, layers do not match perfectly. So we would have tiny interruptions at the, at the borders. That's why I used this trick. And, and then uh, we are basically just interpolating the color between one, uh, one color, which is the lightest, and a darkened 30% version of the same color. So yeah, uh, we are just uh, going from uh, depth zero with this color to depth 10,000 meters with that, that color. It's a pretty, pretty simple style that uh, generates, uh, yeah, this is actually where I was looking, this result. A CSS. It would have been possible to write it in, in SLD, of course, but it would have taken quite a bit more time. Actually, someone was asking before, uh, can I just get the styles in SLD? Well, if you look at the, dat the data directory, uh, let me see if I can find it again. So I go in workspaces, OSM, styles. You will find that each style comes as CSS, but also as, as SLD. The SLD is the one just that your server is actually using. There's a process that uh, checks if the CSS and the SLDs are in sync. If they're not, the CSS gets down, translated down to SLD again. But the rendering engine actually uses the SLD. <coughs> so yeah, you have the SLD for, uh, for all the styles. <coughs> and the style that we were just looking at as CSS can also be seen on SL as SLD here. It's quite a bit longer, of course, but uh, uh, it's functionally equivalent. So let me go out of uh, this page. So we had a look at the stores. We had a look at uh, then. Then, of course, yeah, we we have uh, quite quite a bunch of um, uh, of layers. And then what's interesting are the layer groups. So we have one OSM layer group, which binds together all the layers and their respective styles in the order that we, uh, we prefer. And this generates the OSM-like map. But it's still nice and useful to have the, the single layers uh, as potential overlays, because maybe you want to have uh, uh, to only display, I don't know, the, the buildings on top of uh, uh, another raster map that uh, uh, is the temperature, for example, or something like that. So you have them styled for the uh, group, but uh, it's also possible to use them uh, one by one as overlays. And then we uh, also have the, the two simplified styles, which are simple dark and simple light. If you look at simple light, which is the one that I just displayed here, sorry, not this one. Uh, where did it end up? Sorry, got lost. Let me close a few windows. Okay, yeah. Um, so the, the layer group, as you can see, is actually made of two sub-layer groups. Why? Because uh, when displaying satellite imagery or just raster data in general, you might want, uh, what is it here, to have uh, your uh, base map at the bottom your raster data in the middle, and the labels at the top. 
so that they can, they can still be read properly. For this reason, we took um, the, the data and generated one, let's say, background layer that only contains vectors. So polygons, lines, and points, and nothing else, no labels. And then another group, which instead only contains the labels, so that you can request one, the other, or both. So if I go here and change um, light labels in my preview request, I get nothing because the labels don't show right away. I zoom in a couple of times and I get the labels. And if I uh, switch to the background here, I can zoom in as much as I want and I will not, I, and I won't get any labels ever. Okay. Um, it's also interesting to have a, a quick look at the styles. So let's go straight for something complicated, like the roads or the amenities. Let's start with the amenities first. The amenities are, okay, when I go into a city, oh, I'm not using the local data set. Okay, let me, uh, let me open the local data set. Uh, OSM, here. Here we go. Okay. When I'm zoomed in enough, the amenities are all the shops and theaters and um, police, uh, movie theaters and uh, churches and, and so on and so on. They are all these icons that you can see around. There are lots of classifications for them. So if we look at the style, Uh, we basically have, um, if type is in alcohol or wine, then we use this shield. And then if it's a uh, butcher, then we use that shield and so on and so on. Uh, why are we using shields instead of, uh, of uh, simple points? It's just because this way we are leveraging the GeoServer um, um, conflict, conflict resolution engine so that the symbols do not overlap too much. We are actually allowing them to overlap a bit, but not too much. And uh, as you can see, the style goes on, uh, goes on and on and on to associate each type or each groups of types to one icon. So it's pretty long, but in this case, quite, uh, quite simple. And then we also have the labels at the bottom. So we say, oh, okay, for all these uh, fonts, why do we use all these fonts? Because uh, each area in the world uses different scripts and uh, the default OpenStreetMap that we have actually uses the native name. So if we are over China, it would, the name would be in Chinese. If we are, are over Japan, it would be in Japanese and so on. So we, use, we need all these fonts to display properly all the uh, scripts. And yeah, eventually for some of them, we actually display also a name. We actually made uh, one variation of this map that actually uses um, um, English names instead. Uh, one of the things that we are doing during the import is to import for the moment just the original name and an eventual English name and an eventual international name. We are not importing names in all possible languages because that would generate a much larger payload in, uh, in PostgreSQL. Eventually we can, uh, we can go there and eventually you can tweak the, the imposon file, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, at, at the moment we are targeting either native or, or full English. Another style which is pretty complex is uh, mm, the roads one. So 
you can see that we are uh, ordering uh, everything by Z order. And it, this is very important because there are some places in the world where you have like six or seven levels of highways and railways and uh, tunnels and uh, overpasses that uh, all intersect in the same place. So it's very important to preserve the Z order properly. And then uh, the other thing that you can you can notice from this style it it's that it uses heavily rule nesting. So I define a general rule that just says a sort by Z order, and then one um, less general filter that says okay if it's an highway and it's a motorway on a motorway link, and the scale denominator is less than 15 million, do something. And then another specialization. Actually, if, he, if it's a motorway and it's, the scale denominator is less than 1 million, then use these two strokes, these two Z indexes, this generates the road casing. And uh, if the uh, scale denominator is actually less than 200K, then do a different coloring and so on and so on. And you, you, can, you can see all these little tables during the categorization. Then we have uh, something for the motorway links. Then we move to the highways and so on and so on. Basically, it, um, the, the, the symbology for roads in, in OSM, the, the original one at least, is uh, very sophisticated. Uh, so the, um, the style is pretty complicated and it takes into account the type, the current scale denominator, and, 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 and so on. And we can go, go on quite a bit uh, with all these little tables. Um, uh, sometimes they take into account also the, the type of paving, the surface, uh, and so on. Uh, as you can see, the building blocks are not uh, the, the building blocks that we are using are not all, all that many. You can see this one they categorize based on the scale denominator, uh, providing weights um, and sizes in general based on the current scale and uh, the rule nesting to specialize further and change the colors and the strokes and, uh, and stuff like that based again on larger categories on, of zoom levels. And so on and so on and so on. And then we have the names with all the labels and uh, um, again, uh, we are going to use here, uh, you can see that we are using the, uh, the native name the English name would have been uh, name underscore en, and uh, and moving on to towards the end, uh, basically it repeats over and over for all the types of uh, of roads that we can specify, summing up summing up to one thousand three hundred lines of uh, of CSS. Um, do do do. What else? In terms of importing the data, let's have a look again at the data directory. The process goes by, um, sorry, not this one. The process goes on uh, by um, having you download a geo server with the two plugins that we are using for this data directory, the CSS and the feature pre-generalized. The Docker image already contains it, of course. And setting up the geo package for the low resolution data, the worldwide, which you, you have, and the PostGIS, which you will set up custom for your city, country, or for the whole planet. Um, the low resolution geo package is something that you can go and download. Uh, we are probably going to update it um, uh, along the, the road, depending on the, the customer projects that we do. So we, uh, project by project, we, we will extend uh, the current styling. Like, for example, I know that in a few days, I have to add state names, which are not available right now in the, in the rendering. Um, so another natural earth layer is going to be folded in into the low resolution geo package and the new styles are going to pop up to to render the state names we right now we have the countries 
which covers Europe properly in the, the United States, not so much because you only see United States, but you don't see Colorado, for example. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, the, we have instructions on, about taking um, the right extract of OpenStreetMap from Geofabric. This website does a great service by providing uh, extracts of OpenStreetMap data in PBF format, which is a compact binary format, uh, either for, um, you see, uh, areas of the world, continents, generally speaking, uh, or you can click into them and, uh, and choose by country, or you can click into them, well, okay, Djibouti is small enough that it's not split further, but for example, if I go into Europe and then I go into Italy, there's a, a way to split it into subparts, which are more manageable. All right. So you basically decide which part of the world you actually want to serve. You download the associated PBF you will have to get in POSM and uh, there it gets interesting because in POSM by itself works only in Linux. It, um, it, is, it can be built only there as far as I know. Uh, there are uh, ways around it. You can use a Linux server to, uh, to prepare a PostJS database and then transfer the contents to a Windows machine. For example, that's one way. Or you can uh, start a um, a virtual machine on your um, Windows machine to run Linux locally and, and then have uh, Imposum running in, in there. Or you could be using the, the Windows tools for Linux, which basically create a terminal that embeds a virtual machine and run the Imposum binary in there. We prepared a few um, options for Windows people and uh, um, there would be more along the way. And then, well, you run the import. Uh, there is um, one parameter which is imp very important for performance, which is the dash optimize, which, as I said, reorganizes the, the data along the spatial index. Uh, actually, it first builds a geo hash, clusters on it, and then uh, rebuilds the R3. Uh, technicalities aside, it's going to generate a very good index for you and uh, make sure that the data is matching that index. And that uh, makes um, extraction of small areas much so much faster. And uh, then you have to set up the fonts. As you can have seen from the styles, we are using a lot of fonts to display the various scripts. Uh, the bunch, the large bunch is the Google Note of fonts, and, but, but then we use a, a few more. You can go to the, the Google Noto website and download them all, but they are like uh, many, <laughs> like, I don't know, 100, maybe more. And the, the package is 1.1 gigabyte, so sizable. We have prepared a small zip file that you can use instead, uh, which contains only the fonts that we, uh, that we actually used, and that reduces the, the payload to, to, let's say, 30 megabytes or something like that. And then, uh, yeah, you go and configure your GeoServer. Mm, the GeoServer right now, the data directory uses variables in uh, the data sources uh, to um, act as placeholder for the database password, the port, and so on. This makes it easier to just deploy GeoServer in Docker and stuff like that and specify the location of the database as environment variables. But you can also just go and Re replace the placeholder with actor values in, in the stores. That's, that's up to you. And uh, yeah, this, this is the data directory is actually ever evolving. We created it uh, in uh, August 2019. It contained only the styles at the beginning. So only the CS style, CSS styles. There was nothing else. Um, then, uh, uh, a couple of months ago, we published the entire data directory. 
So with all the, with the stores and uh, the layers and the styles and uh, and, and everything uh, to to help you get started. Uh, a few days ago, we published the simplified styles, the light gray and dark gray simplified styles. And uh, we are actually working right now uh, on another style that I can show you that's probably going to be um, added to this data directory too. There you are. Which we called the marine map. Here we are. Which one do I pick? This one. Okay. Uh, which is a dark blue map meant to bring the focus on the sea rather than the, the, uh, the land. So you have all the references that you want, but the really interesting details you can see only when uh, you go into, when you are fairly zoomed in and then you start seeing the piers and uh, all the uh, ports related and river related uh, features. And those are the ones that, uh, that are actually uh, the focus of this work. So it's, it's basically a variation of the um, simple styles, except that they are actually not simple when it comes to anything that has maritime value. And uh, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be used for uh, integration with an application uh, uh, which is dealing with the ship navigation and weather control and the like. Planning, planning ship trips uh, with weather forecasts and the like. So this is going to be yet another map that will probably contribute to this uh, repository sometimes in the future. And uh, well, uh, uh, as I said, um, it's going to evolve based on the customer projects that we received uh, to, uh, to do specific things. As, uh, as it is our uh, norm in GeoSolutions, we try to make open source whatever we do. Uh, so unless the customers tells us not to share the, the particular style, we're probably going to, uh, to make it available here. OK, questions? Okay, so one question, what is the benefit to create two layers, one for vector and another for only labels? The benefit uh, uh, is gonna be visible only when you wanted to put something in the middle of it. So if you wanted to have a background map of vectors, then you wanted to overlay, let's say a raster map, a temperature map, a, um, a wind map, something that you want to display above it and then you put on top the labels so that they are still legible. So that's, that's the reason why you wanted to split it in two. So that the client side can put something else in the middle between the background and the labels. Other questions about this? Um, it's not clear how you select the label language. We don't, <laughs> and that's the thing. Uh, okay, so uh, right now all the styles are using the name attribute, which is the native name of the of the data, and uh, uh, that's all we are going to to use in this style. So you don't select the language. However, um, if you look at the impose on mapping file. We are already set up to support at least English names. This is the imposer mapping file. And uh, you can see here, there are already three strings, name, name, underscore, en, and uh, uh, international name. We have uh, in GeoServer now, a uh, in GeoServer master, not 216, a little uh, filter function that's called Colash, 
that you can uh, you can feed it uh, lab labels strings in the order you prefer, and it's going to pick the first one which is not null, because very often you you have the native name field but not the name in English because maybe the name in English is the same as native, and you don't have the international name field either. Sometimes you have both. So for example, in a, in a map oriented towards English names, we would use call hash as the function and provide as parameters name an and then int name and then name to you know, gracefully degrade from uh, our preference, which would be the English name, and down towards uh, other alternatives, like eventually in the end the, uh, the name. Um, if you wanted to, to make the, uh, the language selection dynamic, first you would have to import more <laughs> languages. Uh, typically in OSM you have name column AN, name column FR, name column uh, DE, and so on and so on for the various languages. So you would have to import them all so that you have them in the database. And then you could uh, use a, an environment variable in the SLD to uh, get the, the desired language from the client. That's one way. It would be nicer if, we, if the server was reading the uh, eventual lang, um, as, uh, sorry, accept lang attribute of the HTTP request, but we are not there yet. If someone wants to sponsor that development, it would be quite well welcomed. Okay. Uh, CSS are cool and quite small. Is it convenient in terms of performance to maintain a repository of CSS tiles, but actually only use the SLD into GeoServer, which are faster? Uh, if so, which is the quickest way to translate a CSS tile to SLD? Uh, and is it possible to come back? Okay. Uh, is it possible um, to, to go from CSS to SLD outside of GeoServer? Um, yes and no. Uh, we didn't really set up a, a command line translation tool. It would not be difficult to, to, uh, to, to prepare. Actually, there's a main Java class that, uh, that can be used for the purpose. And uh, one could uh, use uh, the uh, GeoServer installation to, to do that, but it's not documented and uh, no, it's, uh, it's not convenient at the moment. It's also not faster because in GeoServer, uh, the CSS translates down to SLD and SLD is used as, the, um, as a translation cache. So whenever there is a request, actually GeoServer, if the, let's say it's the first request. If it's the first request, GeoServer goes and fetches the style. It figures out it's a, it's a CSS. It translates down to SLD reads the SLD and caches in memory the, the Java representation of the style. When the second request comes in, it goes directly to the in-memory cache. It doesn't see the CSS, it doesn't even see the SLD on disk. It's using directly the, the in-memory cached version of the style. So it's actually not, not faster to use SLDs, it's exactly the same performance. The, the only um, performance uh, hit that you are going to see is the first request in case there is not an SLD on the side of the CSS. Is it possible to come back to SLD, uh, CSS from modified SLD? No, right now it's not possible because the, the, the rules are uh, for uh, the mechanics of uh, rule evaluation are different. It's something that I would like to do, uh, but right now we don't have a backwards translator. Again, waiting for funding. Do you maintain Docker image of GeoServer with all the OSM styles that could be used in production and will be continually updated? No, we don't. Uh, we created one uh, that, um, that is used for, uh, uh, as a demo, uh, but we don't uh, um, plan on maintaining one that is going to be continually uh, updated. Uh, 
uh, they are gonna we we probably gonna wanna gonna create some, but they are uh, built on a contract by contract basis. That's how we roll. Uh, Geo Solutions does not sell you products, does not gather uh, licenses. So activities, action happens when there is a specific contract to, to do a specific job. Anything else? Okay, uh, if there are no other questions, I can entertain you a bit further uh, looking at these uh, style languages, because GeoServer supports, as we said, uh, CSS, SLD, but other languages as well, and uh, I can give you a quick, a quick look at them. Um, okay, so let's go and share that. New share. Okay, so this is a presentation that I typically run at Phosphogees, and uh, it uh, compares uh, quickly uh, four styling languages that we support in GeoServer. So in GeoServer, there is a core. The core is actually a set of Java classes, which are inspired in terms of objects, properties, and relationships by SLD 1.0. And then there are a, a set of parsers around it that can turn one specific syntax into this SLD10 inspired model. So of course we have the SLD10 parser for XML that parses into the model. We have one for SLD11. We have one for uh, GeoCSS, which is just which is more than just parsing. It parses the CSS into a, an in-memory version of the CSS and then has to translate because the the mechanics of the, the, how the rules work are different between CSS and SLD due to cascading. So the process is a bit more complicated. We have the YSLD uh, extension, which is basically what if SLD was uh, built on YAML instead? Mm, it basically answered that question. It's, it's a SLD lookalike, but it uses the YAML syntax. And then we have the MB styles community module that can uh, parse a JSON uh, uh, specification in Mabox GL styles and turn it into the common model. Uh, all these uh, styles, style languages, of course, share the common concept. Otherwise, it would not be possible to, to translate into a, a single uh, object model. There is the notion of layer, there is the notion of rules, there are filters and selectors for um, to select which rules up applies to which feature. We have scale dependencies. We have symbolizers to decide how to depict a particular feature as a pointer, as a line, or as a polygon, or as a label. And then there are the differences. What makes its language unique? SLD 1.0 and 1.1 are the only, let's say, international standards. They are OGC styling standards, they are XML verbose, they are hard to hand edit. To be fair with OGC, they weren't meant to for end editing. They were meant for machine export and import on another machine. They were meant for uh, interoperability, uh, allowing two programs to share the same style, but the focus was on programs, not on humans. Uh, that said, in GeoServer, we traditionally edit SLDs by hand, mostly because we never had someone to sponsor a full style editor as a, as a GUI. Um, we added recently autocomplete in the style editor, and it can be generated by external tools like a QGIS, like uh, um, GeoCat Bridge. Um, however, typically the interoperability is limited, and uh, it often needs some hand tweaks but you can get uh, uh, the bulk of it uh, done in, a, in an external application and then fine tune it. This is uh, uh, the SLD 1.0 example of um, selecting 
uh, we, we wanted to <coughs> we want to uh, display a little alpine hat on the right points at, at a given uh, scale range. <coughs> so we have a filter. If type is equal to alpine hat and the scale is below one to a hundred thousand, then please go and pick this alpine hat P16 PNG image and use it as the symbol. I've omitted the boilerplate uh, at the beginning and at the bottom. It's still big enough. Then we have YSLD. It's SLD in YAML syntax. It has defaults. It goes away with all the elements. Uh, the filtering is done by CQL. You can define reusable variables and blocks. Verbosity-wise, it's in between SLD and CSS. If needed, it has a notion of zoom levels too. So again, we have all the feature type styles and then the rules, and then we say it, uh, if type equals to alpine at and the scale is between zero and uh, 100,000, then uh, symbolize this point using this particular external symbol, which is in PNG. It's better than the XML, especially since I didn't include all the XML that is actually need but it's still quite a, a bit of typing. And then we have this GeoCSS, uh, which is based on uh, the general CSS syntax, so a notion of a rule made of a selector and then properties inside for rendering. Uh, it's just that it has been adapted to map rendering and all the property names come from the SLD word. So you will see stroke, mark, fill, all the, the names that come from the OGC nomenclature, which makes it different from Carto CSS, where the names actually come from the MapNIC, map rendering uh, nomenclature instead. GeoCSS uh, also uses SQL, SQL for uh, uh, rule based filtering, it supports cascading, it supports rules nesting, it has autocomplete, and it's very, very compact. All I need to say to get the, the Alpine app to show up is this, three lines saying the type has to be Alpine app and the scale denominator has to be less than 100,000. Then please use as the mark this symbol, done. The, the cons of this language is that um, people get confused by the rule cascading by um, specificity. Uh, but as I said before, now it can be turned off, which allows for compact syntax and uh, uh, no, um, let's say, difficult to understand behavior. Then we have MB styles. MB styles is JSON based, is clearly designed for GUI editing, just like SLD was. Uh, it's meant mostly for machine processing uh, instead of, let's say, hand editing. Uh, in this regard, it's uh, more verbose than GeoCSS. And uh, for example, the, the expressions read like uh, postfix, no, postfix notation, or you might know it as uh, Hungarian notation. So in, instead of saying a uh, less than 10, you will say less a 10, uh, which is, uh, well, not so human friendly in my opinion. The, um, the styling language is geared towards web mercator only. So the only way to, to filter by, by scale is actually you to use the, the web mercator zoom levels. So it's fixed and focused on uh, web mercator maps. The symbols are coming from sprites or symbol collections. I don't know if I have a, uh, yeah, I have it here. Basically you have a large image uh, that contains the sub symbols and then you have a JSON telling you yeah, if you, if you take the rectangle between 0, 0, 0 and 10, 10, there's going to be an owl in, in there. And please extract the image from there. Um, and uh, well, and unlike all the other styling languages, there are no styling extensions like the rendering transformation uh, and, and uh, fancy expression usage and so on. The big pro of this language is that you can apply it both on the client side and the server side. So you can play a game of uh, doing the standards, 
but uh, not do them when, uh, when you don't care. So you can say, okay, I'm going to uh, expose a WMTS with PNG 8, which is going is to make my, my website Inspire compliant, or generally speaking, OGC, ser um, OGC service compliant, uh, but then fall back on uh, WMTS plus vector tiles rendered on the client side uh, when I'm using my own client, which is just a web page, and there I probably don't care all that much about OGC compliance. Um, yeah, and uh, well, you, you can see the, um, the specification. So we have this sprite. Uh, we have the, the filter here, equal is equals type alpine at, which is, as I said, positive x notation. Scale dependency is designed as uh, zoom levels and, uh, and the layout, which contains uh, the icon image. Now, this is sort of a inference. We say the symbol is on alpine out. The client is going to go into the sprite, look at the image, look at the JSON definition, look at where alpine out is in, in the sprite, clip it out, and use it as a symbol. Uh, another, let's say, uh, point that, that makes um, uh, Mabox GL styles rigid is that uh, you basically have to design one sprite pair style. So it's kind of difficult to, to share sub-elements of a, of, a, of a larger style like OSM. You got to, uh, well, basically the, the style is treated as a, as a monolith. So you, you have the, the giant style for OpenStreetMap, and then you have all the icons for OpenStreetMap. If you wanted to make a different map with uh, just a bunch of it, you can snip out the, the elements that you want, but then you also have to go and manually change the, 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 the sprite to contain the icons that you are still using and then go and manually add the ones that you are going to use. So basically each sprite is custom made for one particular map box style. So, um, given the introduction, we are going to go through uh, some examples. So, for example, how do we um, express scale dependencies in the various languages? Scale dependencies are very important in, the, in, in interactive maps because all the maps are multi-zoom level. So, sometimes we wanted to hide and show elements based on the current zoom level. Other times we want to just change the, the sides of elements based on the on the current zoom, like uh, I'm showing below with the, the width of the roads increasing as I zoom in to give the, 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 the impression that I'm looking at a real road. So how do I do the things in the various languages? In SLD, we have min and max scale denominator elements with the full numbers. In YSLD, we can uh, use this range syntax or also a zoom-based syntax. In CSS, uh, one can use the compact SD um, variable and then compare it to a compact representation of the number. Uh, generally speaking, this is kind of the, um, the most compact. Uh, I didn't include MB styles, but uh, there was the example here that you have seen. You basically say min zoom, max zoom, which is really compact as long as your target is Web Mercator. Otherwise, well, going to be a bit more complicated to try and, and match the, the, the zoom levels of Web Mercator to the zoom levels or, or of another grid set. Um, in terms of scaling uh, linearly with, uh, with the zoom levels, in SLD you can say, look, this stroke width, which is 5, interpret it as meters, so that when I zoom in it's going to be thicker and when I zoom out it's going to be thinner. You can do the same in uh, uh, YSLD uh, uh, using the UN meter uh, attribute, or you can go all simple with CSS and just simply say 5 meter, 5M. Uh, questions later. Uh, as we have seen in the example of um, uh, 
um, uh, of the CSS uh, styles, one can use uh, transformation functions and in particular categorize to transform, to map one variable into different values based on uh, the current context. So in this case, I'm um, setting a stroke width based on the current scale denominator. Uh, there is also another transform function we haven't seen, which is called interpolate, where you can just give you give it the two control points at the two ends, and it's going to linearly interpolate. Or you can give a multiple control points to make it interpolate continuously between them, which is kind of handy. Um, Mapbox styles does not support categorize directly, but it has its own way. There are table uh, table based uh, specifications where you can uh, spe specify something like if the zoom level is three, use a stroke with five. If the zoom level is four, use a stroke uh, uh, stroke with seven, and so on and so on. So you can lay out a neat table which does more or less what we do here. Uh, this same CSS is translated down in, in SLD. It's exactly the same, it's just harder to read. So we have the categorization based on WMS scale denominator environment variable, the um, scale denominator thresholds, which are full numbers, so they are harder to read. But besides that, they are the same. So that was it for um, scale-based dependencies. What about point styling? Uh, in CSS, point styling cannot get any easier if you just want to use an image. We have already seen that in SLD it gets a bit more complicated. Uh, it's possible to use not just PNGs, but also SVGs as uh, uh, images. And uh, here is the extension that we created for uh, rendering OSM, where we use an SVG as a mark, that is a shape that we can fill and stroke, and then say, yeah, within the mark, please use this color. The same has been expressed here in, here in YSLD. So if the type is bank and the scale is less than 6,000, uh, use a point symbol, in particular this SVG with this field color and uh, this size. Sometimes you, uh, this, uh, this is another example out of OSM, you have uh, public fountains. Uh, at one zoom level you wanted to have a simple double circle simple symbol, and when you're zoomed in enough you want to switch to an actual SVG depicting the fountain. Um, this can be done in, a, in CSS in this way. I have two rules. If the type is fountain and the scale denominator is less than 6K, then I'm going to use two c circles uh, with different colors and with different sizes. So we basically use the comma in a property to say, please paint another symbolizer on top of the previous. And I'm going to give you all the uh, specifics as parallel arrays. When we switch to less than 3K, then it's going to do something completely different and use the fountain that is VG with a particular field color, a particular blue shade. In uh, GeoServer, we have many, many mark options. We, you can use uh, the built-in uh, circle, triangle, square, and so on. You can pick uh, TTF, TTF fonts filled with uh, um, uh, with char sorry with symbols there are many uh, on, on windows like windings webdings and the like and if you have an Esri background you will have a bunch of other fonts with, which actually contain symbols and you can use them referring them to as TTF and then the font name and then the char code the char code you can pick from the uh, char map in NGO server we have uh, support for wind barbs if you are into meteorology you can specify um, the right symbol based on the current speed of the wind. Um, you can specify random geometries as uh, WKT syntaxes. So you can say, okay, uh, let me move my, uh, my let's say, um, geometry pointer to this point, that point, that point, and eventually you, you draw your little shape custom and, uh, and you, can, uh, you can share it. There's a link here uh, that contains all, uh, all of the symbology that we support. It's pretty extensive. Um, and that's going to, let's say, cover all your needs uh, when it comes to points. 
let's switch to filling. Uh, filling is typically very simple. You typically fill with a color, eventually outline with another. With uh, CSS, the full style for this map is here. In SLD, of course, it's much more verbose, but the elements are the same. So you can see that uh, we picked the, the names from in CSS from the SLD. So I, there's fill here, there's fill there. Here we have light gray because in CSS you can use named colors uh, the, from the CSS standard. And in, uh, in SLD instead you have to go hex. Um, but yeah, besides that, basically there's a, a very strong parallel between the two. Um, you can fill uh, polygons by repeating images. In this case, we have uh, um, graveyards. And uh, here we have a scale dependent, scale and type dependent uh, rendering. So at uh, low zoom level, if it's a cemetery or a graveyard, I'm gonna use this greenish color, which is, uh, let's say, the background, not the cross, just the background color. But if I zoom in enough, then I want to also display the type of cemetery or graveyard. So I'm gonna pick a symbology by the religion. Have this little uh, color as the background, but then overlay on top of it um, a Christian um, cross or a, a Jewish symbol or a generic uh, one to display the type of the, of the graveyard. It's also possible to do the same YSLD. Um, it's just that it's going to be significantly more verbose because I cannot use cascading. So here I'm basically doing specializations. There I, I need to, to create um, multiple rules for it. And each one of them is going to be a bit more verbose. So what was fitting in one slide in YSLD fits in two. One can repeat also uh, little symbols that we prepared, such as times, slash, backslash, and so on, and create hatch cross, or uh, let's say hatch fields in general, which are quite useful in some occasions. Uh, at least in Italy, we use them quite a bit in um, municipality-related uh, cartography. Why? Because they are transparent. So you can add a field, like uh, a cross, cross edge, but then also see behind it a solid field. So you can have multiple fields, one on top of each other, and still, you know, tell them apart from each other. Um, moving on to painting lines. Um, so in this case, I have an example of uh, solid lines. Um, and in particular, they are, it's, a, it's again an example from OSM. Uh, we have these boundary lines, uh, administrative borders. They all look the same. They all look the same. It's just that they display at different zoom levels. So we have the country borders displaying first, and then the state borders display, displaying second, and then the province borders displaying third. So we have this admin level uh, classification. And basically, we are saying if admin level is uh, less than four, so country borders, or if admin level is five or six and the scale denominator is less than 400,000, and so on and so on, please use this stroke so that we, we display you know, the, the administrative borders in more and more details as we zoom in with, with a single rule. In, uh, in SLD, in YSLD, and so on, you would have to to set up one, two, three, four separate rules to do the same. To get, uh, let's say, more interesting, we can also repeat symbols along a line and eventually dash, uh, dash lines along a line and eventually combine them. In this case, in this little CSS, I'm saying, OK, let's stroke dark red, which are the little lines, and also repeat a circle. And then I have a dash array defining how much I draw and how much I skip. And then there's the, the offset, which allows the two arrays to be, uh, well, let's say, synchronized so that the circles are uh, inside the holes 
of the lines and vice versa. The lines are inside the holes between two circles. Leveling. Leveling is uh, the, the, the area where uh, classic SLD failed us, uh, fa failed us the most. Uh, classic SLD uh, only supports very basic uh, labeling. And over the years, uh, GeoServer has grown uh, a very long list of uh, options to, to do more, uh, to group labels, to uh, uh, draft, uh, drape a, um, a label along a line to re um, fit within polygons or not, to automatically wrap labels, to force a label to be painted left to right, even if uh, it would look outside, upside down, whether or not to do conflict resolution, and, uh, and so on and so on. So we have a, a, a veritable uh, platoon of uh, vendor options here. Uh, and typically doing some decent map involves uh, applying one or more, or more of them. So here we are uh, labeling by full name of uh, commercial activities and schools. And then we are anchoring the, the labels below the, the symbols. We are um, um, prioritizing them compared to other labels. We are auto wrapping long, long names at 100 pixels and so on. Uh, we can also do the same for uh, roads, of course. Again, a bunch of extra vendor options like follow line, repeat group, and max displacement to, to make the labels drape along the line, eventually repeat if the line is very long, and so on. Polygon labels are kind of the simplest. They are, well, as simple as point labels. Uh, GeoServer automatically computes the centroid and then places the labels on top of it. Uh, here we have, again, auto-wrapping at uh, 100 pixels so that the national boulder park is actually specified over two lines and boulder community hospital over three. Uh, max displacement allows the label to be moved uh, uh, up to 200 pixels away from the centroid, but still within the, the polygon to avoid uh, conflicts with other labels and, and so on. And here we are, with the goodness of fit 90%, we are saying, look, I want 90% of the label to fit within the polygon. Otherwise, don't display the label. Raster styling also has uh, um, its own set of uh, features. Here I'm displaying in a CSS um, the notion of a set of color map entries that are matching colors with uh, elevations in this case. We can go and uh, do uh, shaded relief as well. And then the result would look more like this, which is kind of nice. Uh, if you have uh, data in um, expressed as 16-bit, you probably want to do contrast enhancement uh, on, on it. And uh, there are vendor options to control how the contrast, contrast enhancement is done. Um, it's possible to do color and blending and composition in various ways, just like mapping and map server do. Here, for example, I'm taking a map of the states. I'm using um, a thick stroke as the map mask for alpha compositing, and then do a, a, a alpha compositing here to just preserve the elements that are inside the strokes out of the original maps, plus the labels which are rendered in their own separate way. Z-ordering we also mentioned before. It's very important, especially if you have uh, an intersection like this one, which is somewhere in Germany. I, I assure you it's real. It contains like, I don't remember, 10, 15 different zoom levels. Uh, it's possible to do geometry transformations so that you can take a polygon and uh, you can offset it for, uh, with a given distance to create a drop shadow effect. You can do rendering transformation, so take data in one form, and process it on the fly through a, through a process, like a, um, extraction of contours, and, uh, and display the contours instead of the raster, or both, if you want, like in this case. This, some of these processes are especially uh, optimized for rendering, so they are actually fast. It's very, very nice if you have a ton of scientific data coming in 
and you don't want to create all the possible representations such as contour lines and uh, and um, er uh, areas of interest and uh, uh, other other possible representations uh, for each and every uh, data that the models generated, but just do it on the fly when you need it and make it fast enough. It reduces the number of the amount of data that you're managing in a very significant way. Uh, in GSOR 14, we also added map algebra. So here I'm actually taking a 13 uh, bands image and computing uh, um, an NDVI index um, out of the, um, of the data. Uh, basically, green is good, is uh, vegetation in good health, red uh, not so much, and uh, this area is actually water. Uh, what if you don't want to uh, to write all these tiles by hand, even if, let's say, maybe CSS makes it uh, shorter, you just really don't want to um, to type all these tiles? Well, there are a few options. In QJS3, there is uh, some improved support for exporting SLDs, such as labeling and uh, rasters, which weren't supported before. And we also improved a bit the, the export. It's you are still going to leak quite a bit of, uh, of um, um, uh, expressivity during the export <clears throat> because the QJX export of SLD is still pretty limited. Like for example, if you have um, attribute dependencies, it's not gonna export them properly. It's a limit in, uh, in, Q in the QJX export code really, not, not in the SLD language. Um, uh, there's this web uh, web tool called uh, called the GeoStyler, and there is actually a plugin for GeoServer as a community module that basically allows you to do a bit of point and click, and it's going to generate the the styles for you. Uh, we are working as a company on an interactive styler that looks uh, similar to Maputnik, let's say, uh, but uh, supports. Uh, uh, SLD and, and CSS instead. Um, these are some examples from the OGC Vector Style Pilot 1. Uh, there's uh, an application called SLD Editor, which is a Java application, uh, which is again point and click and an export. And uh, yeah, I didn't mention it here, but you can also use GeoCut Bridge, which is a commercial application. But right now, there's also a GeoCut Bridge QGIS plugin. Uh, that also allows you to uh, to do the export, but it's uh, uh, I've been told that the functionality is much more complete than the than the core built-in SLD export. I didn't try it myself. I cannot vouch for it, but uh, um, they say it's good. So if you are interested in the topic, take QJS, download the the plugin, and start playing with it. It might be good for you. And that is all. Uh, we still have 10 minutes. I'm going to take another bunch of questions. Let's so, to, uh, to Andrea, thank you. So before you, you start answering the questions, um, I have a poll just to for us to learn how good we did. And if you have ideas for, for a next webinar. So I'm going to launch the poll. So while we answer the questions, please give us feedback to know how we did and how we can improve this kind of virtual events. Thank you. Okay, yep. Um, so we have the poll running. Yeah, please, uh, please go ahead and uh, answer it. In the meantime, let's have a look at the, um, the questions. How to avoid the duplicate leveling from single polygon feature? Okay, so one simple way to, to achieve that result is not use tiling. <laughs> because the, the reason why you get multiple labels, it's because each tile is a separate get map request and GeoServer renders it uh, separately, uh, adding the label in each and every single tile. You can reduce that the result using meta tiling. So when you configure GWeb cache, you can, you can tell it, please use four by four tiles. And uh, that's gonna reduce the amount uh, the amount of duplication. Or you can uh, use the geometry transformations that I was mentioning here. Mm, what is it? 
probably skipped it over already. No, it was before. Oh, there. One of the geometry transformation functions is uh, called the centroid. So you can actually compute the centroid in advance and force the label to be displayed only on the centroid. More options to deal with this problem is, are going to come in the future. I would like to add a way to, to tell GeoServer not to cut the, the polygon uh, on the tile before extracting the label points. It's not there, but it's a common option in other map rendering engines. So I'm probably going to add it too. Is CSS styling supported also using GetSLD parameter? Okay, so we are talking about um, GetMap uh, with an NSLD or an NSLD body parameter. To be honest, I never tried it. I always uh, fill in my CSSs in the um, in the GeoServer configuration, but there should be a, a, a parallel, which is uh, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, I'm looking at the other machine quickly. Um, I, I can't find it, but there, there should be a way to specify also the a style, a dynamic style in another language. If not, it's not difficult to add because we have uh, all the machineries. But yeah, it's something that I never use, so I cannot answer you all right away. If you are interested, you can follow up on the GeoServer user mailing list. I know that you are sus subscribed there. OK, uh, can we export symbology or labels from ArcMap to CSS or SLD? Yes, you can, uh, using the GeoCat Bridge uh, tool that I was uh, talking about before. As I said, it's a commercial application, so you have to pay for it. And uh, uh, let me write. So look for GeoCat. Uh, let me let me type it in the chat. Okay, uh, done. Can you get legend via REST in numerical form and not rendering CSS or similar? Similar. Uh, in uh, GeoServer, in a, in a recent version of GeoServer, you can ask the legend to be returned as JSON. And then you can use it client side to build, uh, to build the, the legend the way you want. Is there any functionality for interactive WMS? Uh, actually, yes, uh, all these styles and all these languages work primarily on interactive WMS. The map that we have seen that I was playing before were used in interactive WMS. If you want, then you can tile cache it using GeoCache. And if you don't want, well, you don't have to. Uh, how do you manage to make it dynamic into a map store? A map store actually stores the, the styles into the GeoServer catalog uh, using the REST API. So uh, after it, it becomes the default style or alternate style for that layer, and it's just a name. Would you recommend the leaflet or Mapbox? Well, actually, Mapbox is, is built on top of leaflet. And uh, um, if I look at our experience with MapStore, we found out that uh, trying to uh, fit all requirements is not so easy. So typically, we, we use uh, uh, three different libraries, which are open layers, leaflet, and uh, cesium um, to, to do the map rendering. Each one comes with a common set of functionality, functionality which is the basic map rendering. And then each one has its own uh, um, different uh, set of extras. So open layers is the one that we use when the server side is uh, using OGC services heavily, like it uses also WFS and it uses also WPS and uh, and so on. So when we need a rich when we need a rich client, we go open layers. If we know uh, that the requirements are really easy. Uh, and we want something small, and especially if we wanted to target also rendering on mobiles, then we typically use leaflet. And uh, well, season we use when uh, a globe is required. 
most of the uh, map store based applications are actually allowed to switch between uh, the three different uh, rendering libraries at runtime. So you can actually accommodate different uh, environments such as desktop and, uh, and uh, mobile and allow a 3D, uh, 3D view uh, if people are interested into it. How can I attach so a normal image to a point as part of attribute when using Mapbox? Uh, that uh, I cannot answer. I don't know the Mapbox styles uh, enough, but uh, I believe that it goes beyond just um, Mapbox, it, uh, Mapbox styles itself, and you actually need to look into uh, the JavaScript libraries for my, uh, Mapbox, but I'm not an expert in them. I just know a, a little bit of Mapbox GL styles. Um, if I'm not wrong, Leaflet does not support the WMS legends. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not a client side developer, so sorry. My uh, normal activity goes down to the very bottom into referencing and reprojection engines and uh, raster processing and uh, reading shapefiles from the bytes of the shapefile up to the OGC services and it ends there. I don't reach into the client side. Any more question? Otherwise we can wrap it up and it's, uh, it's actually time. Yeah, and um, before you leave, please uh, remember to, to respond to the poll because your feedback is really important. Thank you very much. Okay, I have, uh, we have another question. Does SLD or CSS style support geometry transformation for vector tiles? Uh, I'm assuming you want to generate vector tiles and not reading them, right? I, I am gonna go with this hypothesis. Um, so when generating vector tiles, GeoServer uses the SLD uh, or the CSS as the driver. When you are making uh, a, a, complex, a complex map uh, and uh, a complex um, set of vector tiles, you want to keep the vector tiles as small, small enough to be transferred with agility. So you basically have the same set of decisions that you have in a, in a, staying, in a server side rendered uh, map. You need to decide which layers to display at which zoom levels and which features to display at which um, at which, uh, um, at which zoom level. So I want to display roads at most zoom levels, but only motorways when I'm fairly zoomed out and then I start adding um, more and more uh, um, details. Uh, the Mapbox generation tooling uses the style that you have associated to that layer to control what goes in inside the vector tile. However, it's not using the geometry transformations. It's just using the selector and scale dependency and ignoring everything that's inside, um, that's inside the rule. Given that we are talking about geometry transformation, it would be possible to actually make the machinery apply the, the geometry transformation before building the vector tiles. It's just not there. It's just a matter of funding and someone to implement. But right now, it's not there. Uh, all right, how do we do clustering in GeoServer? Uh, clustering as in point clustering. There are uh, two rendering transformations uh, in GeoServer. Let me share quickly the browser again. Sorry, Andrea, and while you do that, uh, I think this is the last question because we need to wrap up. Um, all right, yep, yep. So GeoServer. Uh, point clustering. If you look for it, uh, you should be finding rendering transformations here. The point stacker, which is a, uh, yeah, but it, it doesn't have much documentation, does it? Anyway, it's done by a rendering transformation. You can probably find uh, also something right in our training material that that talks about to the point sticker anyways that's how you do it and and then you also have the the option to do um heat maps if you want mm. 
Yeah, it's here. Okay, let me paste this into the chat. Where's the chat here? Uh, and uh, yes, that's uh, that's all. So I think we can wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Really, really appreciate you sharing with us um, all these. You know, a little bit long meeting, but I think it was good. I appreciate everybody that took some time to join us and and to learn more about what we're doing. And hopefully, you can have uh, now um, a lot of tools to to put your OSM data or improve your style. So thank you all for attending. Please uh, respond to the poll if you haven't and see you maybe in another opportunity. Thank you all. Keep healthy. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, thank you again for participating and uh, I wish everybody a, a nice, uh, nice week and uh, the nice rest of the day. And please remember, respond to the poll. So I'm going to be here like a minute or so uh, just to allow others to, to fill the poll and uh, I'm going then to disconnect. So thank you all. Thank you.